Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is entitled How to Creatively Engage Prospective Students During a Global Pandemic, um, and our presenter is Michael Henniger. So again, welcome, everybody. So before we begin, we'd like to formally acknowledge that BCCIE is located in unceded territory. That means that we live and work on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples so of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So with that, I'd like us to just take a moment to think about what it means for us to be located in an unceded territory. So just before we begin, I'd like to just go over a couple of housekeeping items. And that is that as soon as you join this webinar, you may have noticed that there's a control panel right to, to the right of your screen. And this control panel is very important to manage some of the tools. Uh, you will notice that you joined muted and you will remain muted throughout this presentation. However, we encourage you to ask questions, and you can do that by scrolling over to the questions tab of the control panel and typing your questions down throughout the presentation. Mike will perhaps take some of your questions throughout the presentation, but I just want to let everybody know that we also have allocated some time at the end in the last 15 to 20 minutes to go over your questions in a Q&A section as well. And also just a quick reminder that we will be sharing a recording of this presentation as well at the end. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Henniger again. And Mike, thank you so much for being here today. And please take this. Oh, great. Well, well, thanks, Gabriel. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks for joining everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Henniger, and I'll be doing the webinar today on how to creatively engage prospective students during a global pandemic. Nice light topic for us all today. Um, you know, I, I think BCCI putting on these webinars is, is so important. We see the interest in this topic. I was surprised, you know, as of this morning, we had 450 people signed up for this webinar, and, and I'm looking at the numbers. We're just nearing in on 300 who are online already. Um, you know, and as I was looking at the registration list yesterday, and, and I'm seeing people from all across the country, from language sector, from college, um, from private, from, from public post-sec, from, you know, top-ranked universities, agents, um, service providers, a really wide range of people. And I think everyone's in the same, like, oh my God, how, how do we deal with all of this? So when I talked with Randall at BCCIE about putting this webinar together, we thought, you know, how can we take, try and bring some order of the chaos and, and show some trends and maybe give people some ideas on how we can be better at dealing with this. Um, you know, the other thing when I was looking at that list and seeing all the familiar names, friends and colleagues, hi, by the way, guys. Um, you know, what struck me, another thing that struck me is right now, usually we'd be in NASA. Um, ICEP Toronto would have just happened. Um, BCCIE summer seminar would be coming up. And we usually have all of these opportunities to, to speak with each other and, and to share ideas and to problem solve. Um, you know, I think back to a past situation in the King Abdullah Scholarship uh, Program and, 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 you know, that really torqued the system in Canada when so many Saudi students came in and there was accounts receivable issues, there were student services issues, um, capacity issues. And I remember at these different conferences taking all these time to, to speak to each other and to, um, you know, to problem solve and to share ideas. And so during this pandemic, not only have we been isolated from our students and you know, the topic of the webinar today, but we were isolated from, from each other as well. And we haven't had this opportunity. So I think that's why these webinars are important. And also just seeing all those familiar um, names um, and titles and institutions brought me kind of a feeling of connection. So I know these webinars aren't ideal for sharing ideas, but hopefully you get something useful out of it. And then I hope it can also be a start of, of a conversation as well. At the end, I'm going to have my contact emails, my personal email, my LinkedIn and such. Love for you guys to, to if you have questions that don't get dealt with today, let's continue that dialogue online and, and see where we can go. Um, so let's hop into it. So first of all, takeaways. Um, I like to start every session, every webinar, every presentation with some just high overarching takeaways of what I hope people leave with the session with. And, and um, these are big picture type things, kind of 100 mile view items. But first of all is, Opportunity is out there. And, and what we see is that there's a lot of schools, even small schools, post-secondary language schools, um, boarding schools, colleges, universities, that are doing some really good things. And they've stepped up their game in, in reaching out to, to prospective students and also to current students. And I, I feel that at the end of all of this, when um, you know, they come out of COVID, that their brand is going to actually be stronger than when it went in. So there is opportunity. And I think that we need to see that opportunity at our, at our different institutions. Uh, the next takeaway is, is it's time to get personal, and um, this is, you know, 
something that I speak, this is kind of one of my golden oldies. I, I always feel that uh, academia institutions in general don't do a good job of personalizing their communication with students and whether that's through their branding marketing efforts or that's through the uh, admissions uh, cycle all of this type of thing and I think right now it's time to get personal and I think a lot of institutions are doing that I'm going to show examples of that through this session and and I, I hope that this has pushed us out of our comfort zone in some way that we see that this is needed um, the next point is that the sex there needs to provide solutions and, and I realize that a lot of us are fighting for survival and just fighting to keep our head out of water um, and, and there's so much happening, but there is a lot of confusion in the market with our students. You know, institution A in Canada is doing this, institution B is doing this, and there's very little uh, consistency about that's what's being said regarding September, regarding online, regarding this, and there's all of these uh, differences in messaging that's taking place, and it's creating a ton of confusion. And, and I think we need to provide solutions that are long-term and student-centric, and that's something, a key takeaway that I hope um, I provide some examples of what institutions are doing to put students' mind at ease and say, hey, your needs are first and we will take care of you and we will get you where you need to be. And um, I think that's very important. The next takeaway would be to add new things to our toolbox. And I wrote this in the description for this webinar. It's like, you know, we see people, as I said, getting out of their comfort zone and doing things that they hadn't necessarily done before. And, um, you know, I think that these things were effective pre-COVID. Uh, they're effective during the COVID, and when COVID, please God, is over in a year or 18 months, these will still be effective, and, and whether it's being more entertaining in, in our content, uh, providing value-add um, services online that we maybe didn't provide before, these are things that we shouldn't just be using as emergency stop, me get, uh, stop measures to stop gap measures to deal with students, these are things that we need to consider as best case practice and put them into our strategy, put them into our toolbox and continue to do them. Uh, and then the, the final takeaway here is that engagement is always good. And, and I think that's gonna be one underlying theme to this whole presentation, this whole webinar is that the people that are doing a good job right now are the people that are engaging with their students. And, and this is always, always good. And students are feeling isolated. We're feeling isolated, as I mentioned about even in, in, in our sector. And so any type of engagement is going to be effective. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Starting out with a little gift here. Uh, necessity definitely is the mother of invention. And, um, you know, as this dad knows, there's one way to, more than one way to put a, a ponytail on. And, and this gift spoke to me in a, a few different ways. First of all, education and academia in general is one of the most rigid, rigid sectors and, 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 uh, that there is. People do not change. Who would have thought six months ago that major universities across Canada would be, um, accepting Duolingo as, an entrance um, uh, requirement for, for their language. I mean, it just was unthinkable. But because of these crazy times, people really have found that they have to improve the game. They have to do things differently. And I think this can be a major jump forward in how we as institutions, and how we as international educators do our business. And there's gonna be lessons learned that we take forward. For me, it also spoke personally. I'm a new time, uh, new, uh, first time father. I just had a baby daughter just 10 weeks ago. And so I've learned this from this gift a hundred percent that, you know, I'm doing things now that I never thought that I would do juggling time and all of this type of things. So you adapt and, and you, you do things that, that you have to do. And then maybe also this slide can, can function as a bit of a disclaimer, um, that if you do hear a crying baby or, uh, it, it could happen because I'm living in Vancouver and I live in a condo and she's just right over there. Um, so as we jump into this, um, I think this slide kind of lays out overall what's trying to happen between schools and, and students. And, and really, this is kind of the recruitment funnel. Um, you know, we look at that funnel of getting students' attention all the way down to them enrolling in your class. And I kind of tried to break this down of what this looked like in terms of the school on the left, the, or sorry, uh, yeah, the schools on the left, that the students on the right. And when we look at what the school's goals are in, in terms of our communication, in terms of our, our planning and, and reaching out and, and, and dealing with students, it's very simple. We want to get attention. We're getting attention. We're branding. Uh, we want to get applications. We want to retain students. We want to get the deposits in. And we want to have ongoing engagement. We want to have a good communication channel. Um, you know, and, and if we look at right now what's happening, I think some of these have 
changed in terms of the priority level. I mean, what I'm speaking to my colleagues across the country, what we're seeing is that the retention is the biggest issue. I mean, Canada, as we know, is absolutely just smashing it over the last two, three years. Uh, I don't need, we don't need to talk about this, but the 650,000 international students numbers surpassed. So basically everyone was dealing with capacity and, and just um, you know, volume issues, and then all of a sudden the floor falls out under that and it disappears, and we had all these students that are applied to us and paid a deposit, but are they going to come? So I think the retention has really, really come out as something that has been significant in, in what we're trying to achieve. And then if we go in, over to the other side and we look at, at what the students are looking at, um, you know, they want to get information, uh, basic information about your school. Uh, they want to be able to make a decision. They want to be able to compare schools. Um, they're very ROI focused, and this is something that we continually see increasingly more and more and more. I mean, I shared the story about when I went and did my undergrad, I studied a Bachelor of English Literature because I liked reading books. I wasn't even thinking about a job at all. We don't see that in the newer generation. They're very, I'm going to study this, I'm going to pay this much tuition, then, you know, I want a job, know what kind of job I'm going to get, what kind of salary I'm going to make. So they're trying to get us in there. They want admissions information. They want uh, immigration information, especially true in the Canadian context with you know the pathway to 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 permanent residency. They want to know what the, what the pathway options are. So we have all these things that are on each side that are that need to meet. And in the middle, we have our methods, or or perhaps I could have titled this channels as well um, to to say you know how do we convey this information? And obviously, our website is, is number one. Um, many of us use agents. I, I think probably uh, of looking through this, 70, 80% of the people on, on this call would be, be working with agents. Student affairs are, are, are essential. We attend agent events like ICEF and, and other things like that. Uh, we have partners, two plus two agreements. We use social media and we have direct recruitment. Now, because it's still what happened in, in COVID-19, this has just all been thrown on its head. I mean, first of all, these methods, the student fairs are completely out the window. We've been placed by virtual fairs. Agent events are, are being postponed um, till we're not sure when. Direct recruitment, we can't visit schools, we can't visit students' families. Um, agents altogether, most agent offices are closed, they're in quarantine, um, as we are here in Canada as well. So this whole face-to-face, -face, it, it's really gone out the window. And I think the other thing to add in here is that the bigger factor in this is that the goalposts have completely changed. And in education, when we market, when we reach prospective students and we're looking at that, we have, um, we have these certain goalposts and our application fee is this much, our start date is this much, our entrance requirements are this much, your IELTS score has to be 6.5 or it has to be 7. And these are things that were always finite and they didn't change. And so our whole premise of how we marketed, how we recruited, how we branded ourselves are based on those goalposts and the goalposts have completely changed. And that has really caused a lot of confusion. And, and, and when we look at, and rightfully so, there's no way to avoid that. But when we look at what this this means in the COVID-19 reality, and I think this is kind of from a student perspective, I, I, this slide I created from the student perspective, is that you know, studying abroad is a difficult decision at the best of times. And, and you know, for many families, the study abroad decision is one of the biggest decisions their family will ever make. It's kind of akin to us buying a house or apartment here in Canada. Um, huge financial investment, huge investment in the future, and they really want to make sure. And there's things like, visa, travel, admissions, immigration on the bottom left that all factor in. And, and then in the current environment, you know, you see you add this with the, with the false information going around and, and you see these, I've seen threads sprout up online on LinkedIn and on social media of, of just plain wrong information being shared around post-grad work permits about these types of things in Canada. Obviously, study modalities is, is one of the biggest kind of confusion pieces. Are we face-to-face? -face? Are we hybrid? Are, um, are we going to be completely online? So we see all of these things with modalities in the student's mind as well. And the fact this is changing day to day, um, you know, and everything, I mean, I think, you know, the feds are reacting to this, um, you know, the same way we are in kind of day by day reactionary mode, institution to institution and making different decisions. So this is very complex. There's a ton of uncertainty and there's a lot of anxiety. And, and, and you know, the anxiety, I think, bears just talking about for a second because I know I can only just share my personal experience of having you know a child in this and not having family being able to visit her and you know uncertainty at work not being able to see our friends and, and colleagues we've all felt that anxiety ratchet up over the you know the past month and hopefully now here in BC as we're starting to open up and things are looking positive but, but who knows but I mean even if I look at you know some of the hashtags that have, that have been trending um, you know online um, hashtag COVIDiots, 
hashtag Corona, uh, Corona apocalypse, hashtag panic buying, hashtag my ta- pandemic survival plan. This is not super positive stuff. And I think things have gotten darker and darker as we've gone through. And, and we have to really keep that on mind in that both on our staffing side and our institution side, but also on our partner side and our student side, we're all going through a really, really tough time. And as I transition now into messaging and how we position our institution and what type of content, I mean, we've seen this. And I, I think, I mean, if you watch any TV commercial right now, you see every major, whether it's Papa John's Pizza or, or a Kia or Hyundai. I mean, it's all really positive messaging. And, and I think, you know, it's probably getting lost in, in translation a little bit because there's so much in the market right now. But I just think that it's so important to be providing solutions and to be providing positive feedback and positive answers and, and just a general positive environment for our students. Um, and that's really, really important. And as I show what some of these schools are doing and we go into specific examples from, from education in different sectors, uh, I hope that kind of stands out and we can think about it in this reality of what students and, and our, our staff are facing. Um, I love this slide. I, I look back at the first time I used this slide in a presentation, and it was in 2012 at a BCCIE conference. So this is not a new slide. This is something that I've been talking about and presenting for a long time, for, for eight years now. And it came uh, when we brought, I was working at Thompson Rivers University, and we brought a social media consultant in to help design our social media strategy and our online strategy. And the thing that this consultant identified is that we were putting way too much information out there. It was really, really boring what we were doing on social media. At that time, it was primarily Facebook, Twitter as well. But we were putting out just all the information. And, and this consultant said, look, focus more on engagement. Focus more on entertainment. Focus on fun things. So they put this thing of 70% of what we should be putting out there should be entertainment and 20% should be information. So as I was kind of prepping for this, this session today, this webinar, I, I found that was one of the things that came up is that schools are doing this a lot more. They are engaging a lot more. So it was, for me, interesting to revisit this thing that we've been talking about for a long time and to see that this indeed is, as I said, pre, during, and post-COVID, a really good strategy. And, and with entertainment, I don't want to only think, I will talk about memes and jokes, but entertainment is also, we'll talk about live streaming, it is master classes. It's things that help us pass our time in a constructive manner or a fun manner. And these things create an affinity for our brand. And the point that I'd like to make here is that it's good for people to like your brand. It's good for people to like your university or college or, or language school. And I think the further we go up in terms of ranking of university and, and, and this is that we take ourselves more seriously. And in education, we like to take ourselves really, really seriously. But time and time again, we see that, that schools that reach out and, and, and provide engaging, fun content and reach out to students in a personal manner are really, really successful. So I, I spoke briefly before about trying to separate this in, into some buckets of, of what we had and, and having um, you know, different types thinking about our, our communications that are going out. Does it factor, what should we be doing? And, and, I, and I see different um, sectors, different companies, different schools are breaking down their communication into these buckets. It's experience, it's social commitment, it's free content, or I could just say content, and it's entertainment. And that's kind of what I'm gonna focus on. I'm gonna provide some examples for the next 15, 20 minutes of each one of these. And experience can maybe say online experience. Um, and these are no order. I'm gonna deal with them in, in, in kind of a different order than this. but. I hope you take this and you think, okay, what communication should we have? And, and I'm going to talk about virtual fairs and, and people going to virtual student fairs and meeting leads and not really being prepared to, to follow up with them and to deal with those students. And you say, well, we need to have some kind of a, a content strategy, a, an email marketing strategy that, that converts these students. What type of content should we be sending them? What type of um, you know, things should we be putting on our, our social media channels? And I see a lot of what's being done, as I said, fall into these categories of experience, social commitment, free content or content or entertainment. So I'm gonna drill down on each one of these here for the next little bit and show examples of, of how each one of these break out. So first, talking a little bit about COVID communications. And, and I said before that, um, you know, there's a ton of 
a ton of confusion in the market with students. What's happening right now is like the largest telephone game ever. And something gets said here, and by the time it gets to India, by the time it gets to, to Colombia, it's changed so much. And what students' information students are getting um, is, is not always correct. So providing these, these communications. But also the second point here, and this is the one that I'm going to focus on a lot, is, is providing stability. Um, by giving students assurances, and I think people are unsure, they're uncertain, they're anxious, they need that stability and they need that insurance um, to be able to make a decision. And I'm going to provide some examples about that. And then I talked a little bit on the previous slide about positive messaging, and I talked about relationship building. You know, I have a few sources of uh, where I go to get my information on international education. Number one is ICEF Monitor. If you don't follow ICEF Monitor, you have to. It's uh, information is fantastic there. The other Academica, I've been following Ken Steele's blogs. He's been putting out a lot of really information, uh, good information. But ICEF, two of my former colleagues, Ian Kahn and, and Robin Garcha, did a really good podcast with, uh, uh, with a couple um, uh, secondary school recruiters, Sean and, and another one from, from the U.S. And, they did a really good job around re talking about relationship building and how they're using um, this time to really develop relationships with agents, with families, with students, and taking that extra step to do the relationship. So I would say, you know, go to ICF Monitor and listen to that podcast. It was quite good and it, it helped frame my, my thought pattern for today. Um, but I'm going to focus now for the next couple of minutes on the providing stability, because like I said, I think students are hearing one thing from one institution and one thing from another institution, and then you multiply that by the country factor, Australia is telling them one thing, Canada is telling them one thing, and there is information overload, and they're having a lot of difficulty in, in being able to, to make a decision. And some examples about providing stability, and I know I say this with the realization that we're fighting for, for survival, some of us, and, and, you know, no summer intake, and September's looking really, really difficult for what's going to happen, and there's some, some good trends showing that more students are willing to start their studies online, but I've seen some institutions that have taken a firm stance and provided direct um, feedback on this is what we're doing. I mean, you know, UBC and Cambridge, for example, just saying we are online this year, and that's fact we're online and and that might be a really strong measure to take but it provides certainty to students and they know we're going to be online where a lot of institutions students have no idea what's happening in september they've registered they pay they don't know if they're face-to-face -face. they don't know if they're online they don't know if they're online in canada i mean the other example a lot of institutions now in post-secondary are allowing students to start online in their countries without a study visa um, i personally think that's a very risky and you know I don't know if I want to use the word selfish, but um, maybe a short-sighted approach. Because if that student doesn't get a visa, they've taken a semester and that, that money's gone, and also that's not being refunded. Um, a major college in, in Ontario announced that Duolingo, they're accepting that for four intakes. That's stability. The most of the institutions that I've talked to have said, yeah, well, because of this, we're going to accept Duolingo for, for September. So students are, well, should I be preparing for IELTS if I'm not going to be able to get into September? What should I do? This institution, and I believe it's Centennial, I believe they said for four intakes, allowing Duolingo, this is thing. And that's providing certainty in the market. That's providing stability. And I think that in the communications is really, really strong. Um, academic of the story, I think it was yesterday or the day before, talking about, um, um, oh God, I didn't really know, Ontario Tech, I believe it was, with their student experience guarantee, which is basically for the full year, I refunded any time if they're not happy, and students can defer as they like. Um, and the quote at the end of it says, students can feel confident about enrolling in the fall. And the point that I would make, and I know there's a lot of administrators on, the, on this webinar, and they think, wow, the, the risk is there that you know, we can lose students in droves in September, and just budget-wise, this isn't good. And I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think taking these secure, sure steps to show that the student is coming first, will pay dividends in the long run. And I actually think it will drive revenue up. It will increase the brand and will show students. I had a recruiter from a very prestigious institution in Canada, I won't say the name, but top, top echelon university, tell me about what one of their students' fathers said to them uh, when they were talking about you know, the student uh, visa not being necessary. And the father said to them, this institution just don't, wants my money. They're not worried about my son. That's a pretty powerful comment on where Canada's got. Canada's got to where we are in international education, of course, by our federal policy of post-grad work permits and immigration potential. But we provided excellent service to our students. We provide a fantastic product. 
we have to keep that in line. We have to keep that in sight. And I think to lose sight of that now because we're panicking is, is, is the wrong course to take. So these examples, like I said, accepting Duolingo for, for four semesters, you know, committing to being online, giving students, and this last example, it's the best example that I've seen is like, look, try it. If you don't like it, we'll refund it or defer you. That I think is a policy that students can get behind and truly have faith in the institution um, to be something that um, they feel confident in, in working with. Uh, starting with the buckets we talk about. So social commitment. Um, this is, we see a ton of communication going about this. If I distill down what so social commitment is, it's we, not I. We are in this together. We are doing things, and it's supporting mental health. It's it's just supporting our students and 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 doing what we need to um, get them where they need to be. It's good deeds, and there's a ton of challenges online where you know where giving to charity or whether it's helping other people. Um, all of these things. That's what social commitment is. And I talked about the positivity, and, and I'm even seeing this within staff, staff initiatives about you know, getting our staff spirits up. People are worried about layoffs. People are worried about the economy. People are worried about all of these type of things. So one of the major buckets of communication is the social commitment piece of what does that look like? And I like to look at some of the big players on what they do. Here's some pretty cool examples. Uh, one from Nike. If you ever dreamed of playing for millions around the world, now is your chance. Play inside play for the world. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and this kind of falls into that social commitment. And I, my next slide, I'll show a little bit of what educators are doing. The other one that I liked was, was from IKEA. And um, this was how to deal their instructions for how to stay home during uh, lockdown and during the COVID crisis. You need one key, you need one keyhole, you need 100 uh, rolls of toilet paper, door closed, check, door open, square. Hilarious. I think this is also funny and a few other things because anyone who's assembled something for IKEA, it's akin to, uh, to surviving a quarantine lockdown situation because it's an absolute nightmare. And the problem is it's probably missing the key, right? But here you see some really, and obviously from very powerful marketing departments, people who are really focused on excellent brands, looking at doing this social commitment and taking this very, very seriously. And, and like I said, seeing something, you know, significant come out of it. Let's look at it uh, from an educator point of view. And, and I just picked some examples just by searching hashtags online and from things. And Avon Old Farm School, I believe it's in the UK. It's a boys' school. And it's a little bit cheesy with the brotherhood. But I, I, if you look at their social media, there's some really, really good stuff. And, and what is the brotherhood at Avon? It's the very particles that make up our school, more than just the red stone walls. They connect us or the core of our being extended to the spirit of another avion and no matter where they are on the planet brothers we may not see each other on campus this spring but we remain strong and bonded through and through and then with the hashtag again this rings a little bit with the whole brotherhood thing and the you know all of that it might be a bit much but if you go through and you search some of these hashtags these kids are giving back these kids are giving to each other they've really focused on a collective we of getting through this together and also giving back to the community and the level of engagement. And, and I, again, I don't know much about Avon Old Farm Schools, but it just kind of struck me as I was searching through social media to find trends for this, for this webinar that, you know, this is a nice one. And, and so we see that and that's a kind of example of, of social commitment. Um, the other one is, is FIU and, and Florida International University, really well known for their sports programs, a massive university, um, you know, and also an absolute leader in terms of branding and in terms of social media presence. And I often talk about if you want to see how institutions are doing good on an online brand, um, FIU, hashtag FIU, FIU cares, FIU, kind of good examples of different campaigns of what they do. Again, I found that this one may be a little bit commercialized with having the actual nurse holding um, the, uh, or the doctor nurse holding the, uh, the picture frame there and branding it, maybe it's too much, but it's, you know, FIU face shields are protecting health workers at, at Baptist Health at San Francisco. We're humbled by the service and dedication of our health workers. And, uh, you know, again, showing that, look, we are here to make a difference. And, you know, millennials, Gen Z, they want to make a difference. They, they want to transform the world that they're in. And seeing an institution speak like that will speak, will, you know, will um, connect with them in a very authentic manner. So FIU is an excellent, another excellent example of, of an institution doing this well. Um, panel here. <laughs> this one, I, I think, can be a blend of entertainment and, or, um, 
or social commitment. Uh, but this is another major trend, and it's the distance learning bring your dog today. And this is International School of Brussels, um, and it's their pets bring a day. And it's just a lovely picture of this girl um, studying with a dog. And it's actually funny. There's two things that developed into these weird little themes in my session today, and that is one is babies feature a couple times, they'll come, and also animals feature a couple times, and they'll come again. But this kind of shows that, look, like, we also have to have fun, and we have to care about the wellness and the social commitment, and let's, let's, let's enjoy ourselves. And I, I think that's what we see in what some schools are doing. So again, it speaks to that 70% of, of entertainment or of also the collaborative aspect of our communication. Um, so some examples there. On the entertainment side, and I'm going to focus mostly on the examples here, but, you know, there's been a ton of stuff here of just entertaining uh, people. And, and especially during the quarantine, people have so much free time. They're stuck at home. They're climbing the walls, cabin fever. Um, and so all of these things that we've seen that have developed of, of challenges, of, of live streaming, of memes, of jokes, of student content, the pets, as I had on the, on the last one, this is... This is a great example, and I'm going to use a, a, a case study of ILAC um, in a second and some of the things they're doing and, and the Center for Entertainment Arts, the project that I've been working on with Langara for the, for the last year of really how some of these things do it. And entertainment doesn't have to be frivolous. I mean, the memes and jokes, um, they can be, but, you know, we did at, at CEA, we were doing webinars and um, we had Game of Thrones, we had the, the Marvel, some really exciting stuff for animation, visual effects, and game design. But one of our most successful online classes, webinars, uh, master classes, was we had our foundation arts teacher do a class on um, just how to draw. And we had hundreds of people from around the world uh, join that thing just because, wow, this is good. Oh, I learned, I drew that so well and, and, and engaging. And I know what that does for our brand. We're entertaining, we're providing a value add, we're doing these things. And like I said, it's creating a brand affinity that really is something that um, will speak to speak to students and, and position our institution in a more favorable manner. Uh, nothing to do with education, but I had to use this one. This absolutely cracked me up when I was doing research. Um, so the Zoom culture here has just gotten Zoom and meetings culture has gotten absolutely crazy. I was talking to my friend Pat at SAS Poly, and I think Pat might be on this webinar. Hi, Pat, if you are. Um, and we were doing, I had a, a call with her and, and uh, one of our colleagues, and they mentioned that SAS Poly, obviously not a huge institution. She logged into her Zoom account, and I think it was 70,000 hours of Zoom meetings had taken place that week already. We all have online meeting fatigue. It's everyone speaking to it. What this app has done is called Goat to Meeting, is that you can make a donation to an animal shelter, and for your next Zoom meeting, they will have a goat, or you can choose a different animal. There's pigs, there's cows, there's horses. Actually join your meeting. So I'm not suggesting maybe we do this for students, but this is a great idea for your next staff meeting. You can have Jeff the goat join the meeting, and actually for the duration, he will be there, she will be there being streamed in. And I think... This is just an example of some levity um, and some fun that's being um, brought into to meetings around things and, and, and being personable and being fun and, and trying to enjoy and, and giving your institution a, a personality. So um, please feel free to invite Jeff to, to your next Zoom meeting. I talked about ILAC and, and you know, John and, and Throws and, and Tatiana, the team at, at ILAC, I, I really just feel that, you know, they are the leaders in marketing and in recruitment in Canada and probably, you know, top five globally in terms of how they engage with students and, and agents. They do a fantastic job. I know most of the people here have pathways with them or, or, or competitors to them, but they were very active and continue to be very active on social media and, and um, their online presence and engaging students. And, and when I look at those things that we talked about, about social commitment, about entertainment, look at some of these things that they're doing there. You know, first of all, the one right after ILAC closed its classrooms last week and moved 2,000 students online within 24 hours. That goes back to that core COVID communication, but also, you know, how important the students were to them. But look at the two in the middle. It's the ILAC boot camp, which was being promoted on Instagram. And you could come in and get on Tuesdays uh, and Thursdays, you can get a free online boot camp. Um, then they had yoga classes, and uh, I logged into some of these live on Instagram Live and seen how many people in the hundreds of joining these type of things. And this is a good example of entertainment, social commitment, engagement. 
it goes outside of our traditional comfort zone of like, why am I doing this as an academic institution? Because it's good for your brand, it's good for your students, and it will help students choose you over another institution that's not doing this. And then the one on the right is, is a simpler one. It's just, you know, information about the programs, a more traditional marketing information-based webinar. But almost I see this is kind of the mixture that they have. And if you look at that, you know, we have about 25% of this and, and complete just a, a random screenshot of what they're doing. But if you look at the content, this is kind of the ratio that they're working on. A lot of what they're doing is that 70, 80% of content, entertainment, engagement, and that you know, 20% is like, hey, now let's learn about the programs. Let's get you registered up. So I thought this is a really good example. I'm sorry, that's not me typing. That's my French bulldog walking around with his scratchy nails. I'm not sure if you can hear that. Uh, the joys of, of home offices. Um, the next bucket, content creation. And um, when we look at this, this is a ton of stuff. And, and, and also going into, um, you know, content creation. I'm also going to mix experience in there. I had mix experience in the arrow at the beginning. I'm going to put experience in with the content because companies like Airbnb, for example, if you go to Airbnb, they have these amazing examples of, um, of, uh, you know, being able to go to a destination and see what it's like to experience that destination without being able to travel. And, and a lot of these big things, I, you know, I talked to Medi at apply board and, and, you know, they're dealing with literally tens of thousands of students. And he said one thing that he noticed is that there's been a real increase of students requesting um, VR tours for campuses to see what that school is like. And people are rushing to get their VR tours together and the institutions that already had them are able to have that content that prides the experience. You know, I mentioned before about webinars uh, that we did, master classes that we've done, podcasts and playlists. Um, you know, when we look at MOOCs, when MOOCs first came out and they've really taken off, you know, there's been that hockey stick exponential growth on MOOCs again when they kind of died down because the experiences got better. But MOOCs were generally uh, originally created to have um, as a marketing tool to bring people into the brand and then get them to take face-to-face -face classes. And having this online content, there's been a ton of engagement around there. Um, you know, uh, podcasts, we see these coming up. I mentioned a podcast. Uh, I recommended one with ISEP earlier. And, and, you know, playlists. I know we see... I go to spin class sometimes and spin's been closed, but they've been doing online spin and they've been include, encouraging their members to submit the, the playlists they like to listen to when they ride. And there's been a lot of engagement. I'll show you an example of what we did at the Center for Entertainment Arts around, around playlists. But there's some really, really interesting stuff. And, you know, the, the example I heard about this on the podcast I listened to yesterday with Lee Academy of Maine, who created a one month mini virtual course um, that cost $600. And when students complete that, um, they get a $5,000 scholarship. Brilliant marketing content. It engages students, keeps them active, keeps them from engaging with other schools and, and you losing their business. And then you have a tie-in for them to come back and, and, um, and, and take a future class. So that type of content creation, I think it's really, really clever about how do we keep people engaged. And, and what people are struggling with is obviously the journey online and, and you know, online can be pretty boring. In, in, you know, there's some people that have advantages that have been in a while. And I'll show examples of, you know, I'll use a TRU example of how they're really trying to do something that's experiential in, in nature. But look at what the Airbnb example is. Um, the, the Lee Academy in, of Maine, uh, the high school, that was another excellent example. And, and like I said, the webinars and, and all of that type of stuff. And so when you're looking at what is our strategy going forward and, and even beyond that, whenever you have, a lead generation tool and you have a, a pool of prospective students, you get the same university send that same automated trail. Oh, why you should study with us. We're a top hundred. Oh, our professors featured and it's that content, 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 or sorry, it's that information, information, information in the follow-up following in that 20% of the puzzle that I outlined before when really a lot of it was, hey, join this really cool free webinar. Um, that talks about um, you know, biology, the program that you want to take. I'm just making this up off the top of my head. But engaging people with the free content, student-led content. You know, uh, I've been a huge advocate of student ambassadors, of social media ambassadors, and working with them for a decade to, to have content and, and you know, having students create their own videos, posting pictures, the value on that, but it needs encouragement. It needs the institution to put that forward. It has to be part of, of your strategy. You know, I'm mindful of time here, but really, 
this is a slide that I could talk about. Uh, I think we could discuss for for 20 minutes or a half hour or more of the different examples because there's a lot going on here. And I think it's one of really the the most valuable way that we can engage people that value it, that content. And, and we've seen also like the plethora of of you know free premium Spotify, free uh, subscription to this, free subscription that. So a lot of companies have taken advantage of that. How can you replicate what some of the really big players are doing and have that content that hooks the students in, that keeps them engaged, and then hopefully keeps them down that path in terms of retention or to sign up, either whether it's now or a year down the road. Hope that makes sense. I feel like I went through that a bit quickly, but um, the Center for Entertainment Arts, the project that I've been a part of with Langara for the last year, and we really did a lot of this and um, the, doing a, a webinar masterclass on, on a weekly basis. And we were able to tie in some really high level people. Like I said, you know, the producer from Game of Thrones, seven and eight, a VFX producer, um, working with people like that. And it had huge engagement, but I go back to the fact that the simple drawing one was one of the most effective. So these don't have to be these super complex things. Um, and you know, you look at, uh, um, the quote in the middle. I started watching this webinar at 4 a.m. and it's 6 a.m. here in Istanbul right now. But this webinar was totally worth a little bit of sleeplessness. Thank you. And, and really, if you look at talking about engagement, that's what engagement is. And, and I think, you know, um, as well with, um, you know, on the right, follow us on Spotify and having our students create playlists um, uh, that they can listen to while they're studying at home during quarantine. You know, it was a small school, 130 students, but our whole student population was going through this and adding songs, and, and it was engagement of our current students and shows prospective students, you know, the kind of engagement and the kind of school spirit that we have. So these small things where people think, you know what, it's not like a playlist is dumb. It's not. It's a great way. It doesn't take a lot of energy, and it's a great content engagement tool. Another quick example, I come from TRU, I worked there for, for five years and I'm really close with the people there. My brother-in-law works there and a lot of close colleagues work there and we were talking about what are you doing and, and you know, the summer programs and, and, and these two-week, three-week English programs that are uh, English-based and also experiential-based and, and talking to Lori, the, the director there, on, on what she's doing to, to try and deal with that and, and they've come up with some things and I don't have a time to get into detail, but I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you, to you about it as they've already gone to market with it, is, is that, you know, they've really been able to put together a program that doesn't necessarily focus on English and learning as much as it focuses on the experience and giving students the opportunity to interact with each other. And I know a lot of the language schools are doing a really good job of this, but it's online activities where you're working with kids in different countries online to compete projects together. They're working with Canadian kids and, and Canadian uh, teachers to learn culture and that whole aspect. But it goes back to the content and it goes back to the experience. So it was another, um, another kind of strategy that, that stuck out for me. I mentioned this before that, you know, in 1990-something, Bill Gates said content is king, and that stood through in a lot of marketers saying, you know, content is king, content is king, but that's definitely an antiquated way to look at things. Content is, is king, but engagement's a queen, and she rules the house, and that's from Murray Smith, he's um, a social media and general marketing guru, one of the top minds in marketing in, in the world, and, and I've seen it written engagement, I've also seen it written channel, um, I'm not sure what's the, the right quote, but really making sure that you have that content, but that you're reaching out to people in a way that they can engage. And again, in, for, for the purposes of time, I don't, don't have a ton of time to go through the, the channels of this, but we all know what we're, what we're reaching out on this. And I'll speak briefly on this. Now, I, I want to talk about virtual affairs. Um, I want to talk about it, TikTok and, and Instagram Live, but we see, you know, that these are the new channels. I, I, I mentioned about how many hours we're doing on Zoom. I myself have done, I think, two or three now, um, just in the last little while, Instagram Live of agents. I did Ukraine, I, I did India, and, and having really good engaged group of students coming on Instagram and, and asking questions and engaging with your brand. And I think a lot of us are doing that. I think it varies from country to country, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, a lot of, a lot of different ways people are doing it on Snapchat. I mean, TikTok, I, I've rebelled against TikTok. I refuse to set up a TikTok account. I'm, I'm getting old, I know this, but I just know at CEA, we had talking about student generated content. We had a student generate a TikTok video that was viewed 8,000 times in 48 hours and that was branded with our hashtag. I mean, that's pretty powerful marketing for which we paid nothing, we did nothing, but we encouraged students to use our hashtag. Um, 
the WhatsApp and WeChat, I mean, this has just become irreplaceable now in terms of our communication. So if you're an administrator and you're asking your, your recruitment team or, or um, if you're looking at your strategy and part of your collection is not adding students to WhatsApp or WeChat groups when you're collecting their information at a, a virtual fair or, or when they're coming into the, into the funnel, you're missing out. I mean, the best follow-up that's being done now is through WhatsApp and WeChat. And all this content that I'm talking about pushing out, the information, the entertainment, the collaborative uh, reach out, this can all be pushed out through WhatsApp and WeChat as well. So having that as part of your strategy and, and part of your communication plan is, is absolutely essential. I wanted to like dedicate a couple minutes to talk about the virtual fairs because man, did that change quick, right? Like we were all attending student fairs and 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 doing all of this, and then bang, they're absolutely done. And and some players have been able to transition very very quickly into the um, the virtual space. Um, FTP has been a leader with technology, and they've done a fantastic job. I've heard that you know, and I, these are unverified things. That this is someone told me that that they've had hundred thousand plus Canadian institution at their Educanada fair in Brazil and 6,000 students in one day. So, I mean, pretty incredible, the engagement that we're getting on. I talked to my colleagues at IDP just yesterday, and in three months from May, um, April, May, and June, they're doing 666 virtual events, and we'll have over 50,000 students attend those events. So this is the new norm, and this is the new reality, and, and have you really prepared what your strategy is for that? And, and again, you look, look at everything that I've been talking about, the the different types of communication, the different um, avenues to go after them, the entertainment, the content, the, the information, you really start to have, do you have your strategy in place of how are we doing a virtual fair? Are, is your people just doing the virtual fair, attending it, and then say, oh, hope these students register, you're losing them to another institution because I think the online game is greatly being improved. Um, and... Uh, that really having that virtual fair, what's communication one, what's communication two, how am I engaging them, how am I segmenting them out from different programming and providing them specific content for this, um, and, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about, and we worked a lot about over the last year, um, and you know, specifically if this is something that you have some issues with, and, and you're thinking that you need to up your game, reach out to me uh, on my email or LinkedIn after, and I'd love to talk to you and your, your institution about how you can do this better, because I put a lot of thought into this. And, and like I said, this isn't changing maybe ever now and uh, how important this is. Um, I, I want to teach another case study that kind of ties all this together, and it's from my friend Amit Jalan in, in Gujarat, India, uh, who owns the Agent EEC study abroad. And, and when I look at what they've done, it's one of the agencies I did uh, uh, Instagram live with and, and a real leader of what they're doing online. Uh, one of the biggest agencies in the world, one of the biggest IELTS testing centers in the world, maybe the largest, I don't know, I, I forget the details, sorry, Emmett. Um, but, you know, they were having tens of thousands of students visit their offices per day. And it was really those numbers. I've been into one office and seen five, 600 kids at one time studying IELTS there. Absolutely impressive operation. And then closed overnight. And they transitioned online. And if you go and look at their Instagram, their Facebook, um, any of these channels, they have absolutely basically all day, every day, free content running. And whether it's IELTS training, whether it's speak to a student who's studying in Canada or, or the U.S., speak to a, a recruiter, a director. He's had presidents from, from large universities across Canada speak on his platform. Um, and, you know, looking going down, not only do they use these videos, but then he has a repository of teaching videos that you can search by, by institution type, you can search by grammar or writing. So they put a lot of effort into going online, providing content, providing entertainment, providing value add, uh, and organizing it in a way it's, it's accessible. And I know, um, I mean, I was speaking to him on WhatsApp yesterday and he told me like they've gone, you know, I tripled their Instagram followers up to around 40,000 in, in uh, a month and a bit completely organically with no paid as well, um, just by having people engaging with that. So, um, uh, so yeah, I think that this is just another great example. So if you're looking at what someone in the market is doing, and I, I've always said that you know, agents really know the local market. They're dealing with these students on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and we are looking at trends of how to, to reach them, looking at what agent partners are doing. And I just felt that EEC, was such a strong um, example of that. And, and I'm 
getting close. I'm going to try and wrap it up now and get to questions because of that. And, and I'm going to leave with this another baby um, thing and, and I'll leave it you with this gif. I think you guys have probably all seen this on this one viral. Yeah, I got it. Um, and why, why I'm ending with that is, is like, you know, we are outside of our comfort zone and, and we're doing a thing that maybe we don't think it's possible and, and we're not sure how we're going to do it. But going down that path and trying these type of things is absolutely essential. And you don't know where these huge successes are going to come. And I think, you know, as this baby got lucky with the bottle flip, you know, with well-planned, well-educated guesses in some cases, but strategies that go through and push us outside of our comfort zone, um, these are things that we can really, really excel at. So that is the baby theme coming back again. And one last thing, I told you that I just had a baby and this is a picture of baby Mika and I'm imagining a collective oh, all across the webinar because she's a little sweetheart. Um, and I just wanted to end on a positive note to say that, look, we've been going through a lot of things and there's all of the stuff that, that we're dealing with, but you know, there's such positives and, and our friendship and our colleagues and what we do at the end of the day as international educators is just so important. So don't lose sight of what's important. I also put my personal information up there. Uh, it's my personal email and my LinkedIn. Um, if you feel that this kind of talk or something similar, I, I have a variety of decks that I do in terms of student services, marketing, recruitment, social media, professional speaking, um, all of these type of things. Reach out to me. I'd love to engage with you or your institution. So um, with that, I'll pass it off to Q&A, and I think I went a little over time. Oh, we're okay. Um, so I see that there's some question um, there. Okay, let me try and get through to this. Um, Yeah, there's a really good question here that I have to be honest, I don't know the answer to. It says, any tips or strategies on security and virtual engagement, um, you know, Zoom bombing, potential hostile chats, you queue in boxes, targeting speakers, et cetera. That's a really good question, and I'm just going to completely spell that. I don't know. It's been moving so fast. I know Zoom and, and you know, with their the login IDs and, and trying to do um, more of this, it, it's coming. I think as well it's sometimes you know when we first got into the social media sphere and people are really i think comms directors and and um you know administrators at university are really uncomfortable with the discussions you know losing control of the discussion on social media what i've already said is these discussions are, are taking place no matter what and and it's better to be a part of them and to not be a part of them so at least you can can lead this and, and i think it's something where there's some sharks swimming around the water but you know, we still have to jump in and swim. So, sorry, I kind of ducked that question. Um, so there was, yeah, a couple of people asked that. So I'd be interested if people have the thing that's, um, you know, uh, love to hear what other people think about that. The next question is, is what is the best virtual fair platform in your opinion? Again, great question. That's very, very difficult to answer. I mean, I think people are, are, are working on, on this, the bespoke uh, thing. I mean, I think what's, what's come out is that, you know, Zoom or, or Skype for business and stuff doesn't work on, on these large scale. As I said, I'd I look at what I said is FPP and I would look at um, um, IDP and some of these larger agencies. I've talked to several people who are coming and launching this. I, I've Two companies, I won't mention names, but in the last week that said that they're coming out with what they think will be very good software solutions that will go to market. So I think what you're going to see in terms of this is that you're going to see third-party solutions that will come with um, a really good, really good solution. I mean, there's a Marcom Pro that, you know, I know a lot of ISEF and, and, and the BCCIE and other people use these type of softwares for meeting requests. I think what we'll see is over the next two months that the technology is really going to do this and it's not something that you're going to have to figure out on your own. There's going to be a lot of um, third-party providers that, that are able to deal with that. Uh, great question uh, next is that many of us are managing uh, social media off the side of our desk. Yes. Which strategies do you think have the most impact and the least amount of time and energy? And uh, I do, I think, have a good answer to this one. I ducked the last two a little bit. But I, I think for this one, for me, I've really found is that the social media student ambassador approach to, to social media content you know what? Find a couple really engaged students that you have a relationship with them. Come in, provide them some training, provide them some parameters. They don't answer admissions questions. They don't answer certain things. So you have things that they can say, 
You have an approval process where they submit, um, you know, uh, a content schedule for you for the next week. You use something like Hootsuite that you can program this into and, and put it out. But I think really leveraging student content and getting student ambassadors, social media ambassadors, give them a small bursary, give them a scholarship. I found this to be a very, very effective. We've done this. I, I've done this in different capacities at different institutions for um, close to close to a decade now. So it really takes away your time and the content's better. Um, I think that is all the questions. Um, I'll pass it back to my colleagues at BCCA. You guys, thanks so much for, for taking the time. They just posted on there about more about our survey. I'd love to get feedback on, on, on how the session went. You think um, things that were missed, things that were left out. We continuously had 300 people through this whole session, so really good turnout. And then I hope there's some valuable takeaways for you. Um, and uh, like I said, I would love to engage with any one of you. Feel free to reach out to me on my email or LinkedIn, and let's continue the conversation if I can be of assistance. And uh, so all my friends and colleagues uh, that I know so well, I look forward to seeing you very soon at events and uh, miss all of you guys and, and uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Mike, for that very engaging and entertaining presentation. I'm pretty sure all of us laughed at many points. Um, thank you so much for the GOAT to meeting tip, I think. Get a go. Get a go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, that, that one's a very useful one. Um, so again, thanks, everyone, for attending this webinar. Um, I hope that you found this webinar useful. I'm pretty sure you did. Um, just a quick reminder to please fill out the, the feedback survey. We just posted the link on the chat box, so we would really appreciate it if you could tell us how we did and what other sort of content you'd like CCIE to offer, or if you'd like to see a version two of this webinar with Mike Henniger, um, that would be amazing. And then with that, I just want to remind everyone that we will be sharing a slide deck of this presentation, as well as a recording soon after. So thank you so much, and I wish everyone a great day. Thanks for attending. Yeah, I was I will also just want to thank a few of the people that really helped me out. I put this deck together very quickly, and um, um, Sherry at Thompson Rivers University, Mia University Canada West, and, and many others, but you guys specifically helped me with some content and things like that. So a shout out to those people for, for helping me. Uh, I couldn't have put this deck together without you, so thanks, ladies. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. Thanks. All right. Bye.